The following is a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. I have to warn you now, I feel like I'm going to talk really fast and tell you a million things because I only have you for less than an hour and I want to get as much in as I can. So I'm going to talk like a crazy woman. I'm going to give you lots of resources and then you're going to go get them. Okay? You're, it's going to be great. So... You all are wondering, what are my little pillows for? Uh, I've decided that this sums up the different people that are here for the marriage retreat. <laughs> you got the good marriages that are totally dialed in and they're here because they're never content with being where they are and they want to just always keep learning and growing. That's awesome. Then you've got the, the good marriages. They're good, but, you know, they have some struggles, and already there's been some helpful things that have been said uh, that they're like, oh, if we could implement those, that would probably take the kink out of our marriage. Cool. Then there's the next little person who it's so bad you either have to laugh or cry. Um, and then the last person is someone that thinks that uh, it's too late. Eric has already said it. it's not, it's never too late. Because if you say it's too late, you're, you're saying God is not capable. So don't say that. No matter how you feel, don't say that. It's not too late. Um, and I hope you keep hearing that over and over again. So let me start by reminding us all that lawnmowers, teachers, hygienists, dentists, lawyers, pharmacists, factory workers, farmers all have some sort of job training, okay, to, to do their job. They have tests, they have standards they have to meet. I think it's rather odd that we as women are, are most called to be wives and some mothers, and there is really no training, no tests, no diplomas, no nothing. You just kind of are thrown into it sometimes. And some of us have had training from mothers, but some of us have not. And so there's a problem with just starting a job. And I guess people expect that you're going to learn as you go. But what's the problem with the learn as you go method? You make more mistakes. OK, so if we don't want to make mistakes, the good news is that God has not left us to ourselves. Maybe our mothers have. Maybe women in our church have, maybe other family members have. Um, God has not. He has given us exactly what we need in his word to navigate this thing called marriage, relationships in general, um, but specifically as we're here for a marriage conference. And I want to pass this test, but I want to do it in a little different way as we talk today. I don't want to give you principles. That's what Eric is doing. We'll let him be the pastor. I would like to give you practices of those principles. I'm going to give you a ton, so get ready to write stuff down because you're not going to remember everything I say. Then I want you to be able to take this stuff and do something with it. Now, I appreciate you older, wiser ladies that are in the room that could probably teach this message. I want you to be listening because I am going to have a question for you at the end. If a lot of this is familiar... I'm going to have a very important question for you at the end. So I thought, let's approach this like a study guide. We're going to make a study guide. And there it is on the board. If you hear nothing else I say, um, we're going to talk about God, yourself, your husband, your kids. Because this is a marriage conference, we're not going to focus a ton on kids. I'm just going to give you a couple little things to think about. But these are the main things I would like to talk about. So I want to read you a quote. Some of you have probably heard it before. If you've ever heard me teach, I probably use it every time I teach because it is a great quote. A.W. Tozer says about us that what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I'll say it again if you've not heard it before. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So while you are opening your Bibles to Exodus 2, I want some people to just shout out some of God's attributes. I'm going to write them on the board. Holy. Mm -hmm. Wise. Faithful. Trustworthy. Faithful. 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 
trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Forgiving. Okay, so easy to just name off a bunch. We'll start with those, okay? Exodus 2. There's obviously many more, but there's a good start, and it's so easy to start naming them off and keep going because once you think of one, you think of another, and they're, start, they're clicking in your brain. All right, follow along. Exodus 2, 23, verse 23. Okay, here we go. Look for a little theme here. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Did you catch that? I was kind of saying it so that you would catch it. God heard, God remembered, God saw, God knew. Now, I didn't realize we'd be in the middle of Deuteronomy or the beginning of Deuteronomy as I was getting this ready, um, but now more than ever does it apply. Do you ever feel like an Israelite? <laughs> no. You cry out to God, he does all these amazing miracles, then fear creeps in. You doubt his ability to help you in a particular area. Why do we do this when theologically we know we don't need to do that? Why? What word comes to mind? Why do we do that? We forget. It starts with an F. It's close. Fear. fear. <coughs> we fear. Ooh, I'm really good at that. <laughs> so if you have any questions of how to not do that, see me after, and I will tell you all the things that I've done in doing that. But listen to this helpful quote. I thought this was so good, a book on fear that uh, myself and the lovely lady that's in this room that disciples me um, read this book together. Okay, here's the thought. Fear exalts people and belittles God. Okay, listen to this quote. It's by John Flavel in Triumphing Over Sinful Fear. We exalt a creature, a creature's power, by fearing it. We give it power over us. In doing so, we elevate the creature beyond its class and rank to the place of God. To trust in any creature as if it had God's power to help us or to fear any creature as if it had God's power to hurt us is exceedingly sinful. I do that. True confessions. I let things in my life get exalted over God. Instant problems every single time I do it. I don't know why I keep doing it, because I feel like an Israelite, but I do that. And I have to reshift my mind over to who God says he is and believe it, right? So let's list out some areas, and you better do this as fast as you did God's attributes. Some areas that women struggle with, okay? Go for it. it we're all assuming you're talking about your friend, not yourself. <laughs> Go ahead. Body, Body image. What was that other one? Doubt. Doubt. Okay. Okay. What was the last one? Identity. Identity. Okay, we'll stop with those. Now, what we have to learn to do is to connect God's character with our struggles, okay? So here's something that I do. If I meet with a woman who is struggling in her marriage, I actually don't pick up a marriage book first to go to straight to, and I have a bunch here for you to look at, 
to take pictures of so that you can get them because they're all wonderful. That's not the first thing I go to. Because if I'm telling her to trust God with X, Y, Z in her marriage, and I give her a marriage book, and she doesn't really know her God in a sustaining, vital way, the marriage book is just going to be a Band-Aid, right? So know your, knowing your gods is so important, and ironically, Eric just said it, is so important to being a good wife and all the other relationships that come into that because that is going to be whether it is a great marriage or a not so great marriage that's going to be what you're going to have to fall back on for joy and contentment and it's not it's not going to be easy but it's going to be doable because God doesn't give us things that we can't handle right Um, so listen to this beautiful quote this is A.W. Tozer again he's really good to quote three characteristics and I want you to think about You know, pick one of these for yourself in this moment when I read this quote. And I want you to hear this quote and apply it to that particular problem that you have. With the goodness of God to desire our highest welfare, the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it, what do we lack? Yes. Anything that you want in my notes, you can take a picture of after. If there's a quote, you just can't write it down fast enough. Um, You can just take a picture of it after. Um, With the goodness of God to desire our highest welfare, the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it, what do we lack? The The obvious answer is nothing, right? But that's just three. That's just three of God's attributes. So keep piling the rest of them on there and preach that to yourself when you're struggling with something, you know, and and let it sink in because that is the God that we serve. So, so much more I could say on this and it's all I can do to not say anything else. We have too much to cover. So God, know your God, super important. I'm going to give you a little tool in a moment to do that if you have not done it before. The second one is knowing yourself, okay? Now, this is what is in your lap, this renewing guide that I have photocopied for you. We're not gonna talk about it a ton. It's very self-explanatory. There's, you know, it's double-sided, so make sure you read all of it, um, and then you'll understand how it works. But the question you have to ask yourself before you even get to this article is, What is so important to you that you're willing to disobey God to get? Ooh, that's an awful question to have to ask yourself. What is so important to you that you will disobey God to get it? Mm. You might want to do that on your own, not in a small group, because it's going to be a painful conversation. Okay. Knowing yourself knowing your sin, okay, is going to become a big, big help in this moment. I want, to, I want to point out two things. The Old Testament, and you can even, I have this written at the top, so this might be helpful to kind of write. The Old Testament talks about, um, oh, this pen is not the greatest. The Old Testament refers to um, idols or idolatry as a drifting from God. The New Testament says the same thing, but it uses a different word. It almost kind of sounds nicer. I like the New Testament word desires, right? Desires are good, right? (laughs) I have a desire to be married. I have a desire to have children. I have a desire for my husband to love me. You know, all of these things. They, they sound lovely, but let me read you this. I'm going to show you the front while I read just a little paragraph because I'm going to set this also on the side. If this intrigues you, take a picture of it, look it up on the internet, print it out. Um, this is an article about fighting lust with lust. Sounds intriguing. Let me read you this. The title of this article is intended to make us think. As we consider the fact that lusts are desires, oh, 
Well, that lust doesn't sound good. Okay, that messed that word up. And in the scriptures, these desires can be good or bad. Ah, so we can have good or bad desires. This depends on how they line up with the will of God. So how do we fight these desires? We do it with desires. Your chief defense against sinful lust is an all-out offensive of sanctified lust, if you will. It is to set our hearts upon the supremacy, sufficiency, and beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in this posture of continual satisfied delight in Jesus that the lust of our flesh in this world evaporate into vapors like the steam on our morning cup of coffee. Now you want to now you want to look it up because it is a really good article. I've read the whole thing; it's super helpful. So, okay, now we know God's character. Now we have this sheet. I want to talk a lot about this, but I can't. So I want you to take it home, and I do not want you to do what you do at other conferences, maybe, <laughs> which is stick it in that desk that has a pile of other stuff in it, and you look at it two years from now, and then you say, oh, my word, why didn't I look at this sooner? It's so helpful. I didn't make it. Somebody else made it. So it's, I'm not saying to read it because I made it. So good to help identify idols in your heart, okay? Listen to this um, quote. Idols lie about God's character and identity. Okay, so now we're, here we're going back to God's character. This is all, like, so important. It all intersects. I'll say it again in case you want to write it. Idols lie about God's character and identity. Okay? Now, on the back of that guy with the tree is also, if you've never done a study of God's character, this is a super simple way to do it. It lists them out in numbers. There's 19. Work it out in your schedule. If you want to do one of these a week, then in 19 weeks you're going to have studied all, you know, God's characters. Great. You can look up the corresponding things as you go. Um, so this little two-sided sheet of paper is actually a really great resource for several different things. And if you have any questions about it, I'm here just about every Sunday. I'm here today. So if you get it and you read it and you're like, oh, I don't understand this part, come talk to me on a Sunday. I love talking about that kind of stuff. So... Um, Yes. Then another thing, Liz, is that thing on the website yet? Not yet? Okay. So we also have on our website, the women's ministry page, uh, underneath it is that dis deliberate discipleship plan that I made. Some of you already have it, so that might be old news, but some of you that don't, it goes through prayer, Bible study, the gospel, a couple different things, and it's right there. You can print it off for free, and there's another resource. So um, regardless of what you do, or maybe you have a book that you've had on the shelf for a long time about God's character and or your sin, pick that up and read it because it's going to be super helpful. Okay, so God, yourself, third, this is one we're going to stay a little long on since we're at a marriage retreat, is your husband. Have you ever noticed that most women's books have the general same table of contents. You know, it's usually communication, finances, intimacy, homemaking, submission. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everyone you pick up, you can look at them here. I've done it. Um, they all say the same thing. Well, it's probably because of passages like Ephesians 5 and Titus 2 and others. But there's, there is another reason why they're all the same. Can you think of maybe what that might be? Yeah, because that's the areas that we sin in. <laughs> Those are the areas that aren't easy all the time. So um, it might be helpful to remember that we all struggle with the same sin. Even our great-grandmothers did. They didn't struggle with getting on Pinterest more than they did laundry. Uh, but the fact that they didn't have laundry machines made up the time that they would have said, so whatever. But um, here's why this conversation gets sweet, is if 
I know that you're all struggling with the same thing. And you all know that pastor's wives aren't perfect, right? (laughs) Newsflash. I struggle with the same things. Then we can help each other. We can talk about this. I'm not going to be shocked when Sid comes to me and says, Danelle, I'm having a hard time submitting to Andy about this. Or Liz comes to me and says, okay, how do you be patient with your child when she's had diarrhea for two weeks and has, you know, messed all of the clothes and carpets and chairs in my entire house? Was it two weeks? No. It was almost two weeks. It was about a week. That's long enough. A week is long enough. We all struggle with the same thing. So if we can get more used to remembering that we know we're both sinners, then we're not going to have awkward moments where we're trying to explain to someone like, you know, the workup of I'm a sinner and this, oh yeah, we already know that. So let's, let's get over that and get on to with what we can know and and how we can help each other. So I want to give us three things to think through in particular when we are thinking about um, our husbands, what role does Genesis teach us that God intends us to have in our marriages to our husbands? Helpmates. Helpmates. Okay. So we'll start with that word, helpmates. Whoops. And I'm going to give you three areas. Again, So much more, we could have just taken a whole morning on God or yourself or one of these, but I only get you one time, so I want to squeeze it all in and you can sort it out later. Three areas that usually get covered in premarital counseling. Who's been in premarital counseling recently that can answer this question? Just shout it out. Three areas. What are they? Okie dokie. Communication. finances, and intimacy. Okay. So I want to break these down quickly um, and talk about three areas. And I'm just going to give you a couple of sub points under each one to consider, think about later. Um, The first one is under communication is know what your Bible teaches about the tongue Know what your Bible teaches about the tongue. Now, and and that's the easy part, right? Because a lot of us know James 3 and all those lovely verses. The problem is actually obeying. (laughs) We have to actually obey it. And then when we don't obey it, which we probably won't perfectly because we're Sinners. sinners, what do we do then when we don't obey it? We ask for forgiveness and repent before God and our husbands. So... Again, scary verses. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not be so, but yet we don't always practice it. Um, How many of you had little siblings when you were younger that tattletailed on you? I was the oldest of two, so I got tattletailed on a lot probably because I was doing things that I should have be tattletailed on. But John MacArthur makes this really interesting statement. He says, your tongue, your tongue is a tattletale on your heart. Oh. Oopsie, it's not the siblings anymore. It's our hearts. So that's maybe even worse. Um, be aware of what the Bible teaches about your tongue and then obey it. And when you don't obey it, repent of it so that you can keep going forward and not backwards in your marriage, okay? Second thing, apply good material on communication. Um, Two great resources I recommend on this, apply good material, is... um, Where did it go? There it is. It's a small book. That's good. Everyone likes small books. Um, This is Resolving Everyday Conflict by Ken Sandy. For those of you that go to Castleview, Eric and I have, uh, or Eric has talked about 
you know, the whole inspection that we do once a year, we go away, just the two of us, no kids. We brought this book with us a couple years ago because we felt like we were picking at each other more than normal. So good. We read a chapter a night separate from each other, and then we came together to discuss it. So good. So helpful. Ken Sandy, you can take a picture of it. Uh, the other one that you might be familiar with already is War of Words by Paul Tripp. Ooh, that's a good one, too. Really good one. Um, use resources. There are so many resources, but you cannot walk into a Christian bookstore today and grab any book off the shelf because they're not all good. So seek an older godly woman that you know is reading good books and say, have you heard of this one? Should I get this one? Because there are some I would not recommend, and there are some I would recommend. All these are recommended. Um, but if someone has taken the message of reconciliation and biblically packed it in a little book for you to then read it and think about it, take advantage of that resource. It's helpful. It's like another installment of premarital counseling when you read a book like that. Um, so apply good material on communication. And um, again, like Eric even said, when you learn something about your spouse that explains why they've been behaving or saying what they've been saying, it's a wonderful thing. It feels like a clog is, you know, been cleared out. And you're like, oh, yeah. So learn these things about yourself or your husband or both. Okay, now this is a really important one. We, we, we uh, recommend this in premarital. Number three is revisiting an argument and learning from it. When you are in an argument, you're emotionally charged. You're almost always in the defensive mode, <laughs> ready to fight back. And that is not necessarily a good time to dissect the argument and talk about it. I'll give you an example. When I had um, young toddlers, uh, Eric comes home from work one day and comes through the sign glass door and I'm fixing dinner and he's noticing I'm impatient. I'm clearly being impatient with the boys. And um, he says to me, have you had your quiet time today? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, have you had yours? Oh. <laughs> he did, I'm really glad, because I was here with the kids, not sitting in an office with a coffee. Thank you very much. And so he says, well, why don't you let me take the boys for a walk and you go upstairs and read your Bible. <laughs> so I went upstairs and I <laughs> flopped my Bible open on the bed and I was like, I'm just going to flip it open to something. I don't even care. You know, I'm all in this bad attitude. And then I do randomly plop it open to something and it's something really convicting. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Okay, I'll listen. So I, I then, of course, was feeling bad about how I was responding. And so then later, after the boys went to bed and dinner was cleaned up, we sat back down and I said, okay, when you said that, my dukes were up and I was ready to go at it with you because that was irritating the way that you said that to me. Um, if I've already not had my quiet time and I'm not walking in the spirit, now is not the time to get into a conversation with me about that because I'm going to have more non-spirit stuff come out of my mouth. So it'd be better, I said it'd be better for me if you don't, don't try to be my Holy Spirit. Come in, ask the, don't ask the question, just say, let me take the boys on a walk. I know what you mean when you say that. Then I will go upstairs <laughs> and I will let the Lord deal with my heart and then I will come back downstairs and we will have a much better night than we would have had otherwise. Um, super good to do that after your emotions have been diffused and hopefully you've spent some time with the Lord and gotten a hold of yourself and your sin, then have that conversation because, newsflash, our husbands do not know how we think. So if I was assuming that he knew that I, you know, no, 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 don't do that. Tell him. It's okay to tell him. So revisit your arguments. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it does. 
So, um, okay, fourth one under communication is seek discipleship. Eric already said it again. Um, counsel from other Christians. Don't think you're the only couple that argues. I think Satan tells us that because he doesn't want you to fix it. He wants marriages to fail, right? So then this is just me. I'm the only one dealing. And Liz would never understand if I told her that, you know, I said this to Eric. She wouldn't believe it. Yes, no, she would because we're both sinners. So just say it. Um, We had a really cute couple come in. in premarital counseling and they came in, you know, premarital, you're like all over each other. You can't wait to get married. You're so loving, loving. Everything's great. And everything you do is great. They come in and they both sit on opposite sides of the couch with a full cushion in between them, which never (laughs) happens during premarital. They sit, we chit chat for a little while. And then Eric says, well, do you want to tell us now or later? (laughs) And, and they're like, what? And they both look at each other. Did you tell him? Did you tell him? No. Eric says, well, you're sitting so far away from each other. You've obviously just come from having an argument. They're like, how did you know? (laughs) This is not our first time doing premarital counseling. So it was so cute because they opened up and and then everything gushed out. And they said, we just really, and we're getting close to the wedding at this point. We just really think we might, should not get married because we've been fighting and you guys don't fight. And then they start to list off these godly couples at the church that we were at. They don't fight, and they don't fight, and you guys look like you have a great marriage. And we're like, where did you see that in the Bible? Because I've never seen that in the Bible. And so anyways, they were so cute. And then we told them, it's not a matter of if you're going to disagree in marriage. It's when you're going to disagree in marriage. Do you have the tools in your toolbox to fix the communication error, because that's all it, all it really is, aside from your own heart idols that might be aggravating it. Um, but it's, it's a lot of times it's just the communication issues. So know your Bible, what it teaches about the tongue, apply good material on communication, revisit an argument and learn from it, and seek discipleship or counsel from other Christians. All right, now the next one. Oh, I already wrote it. Finances. Let's talk about finances. How many of you have done that Brad Graber class? Raise your hand. We're in the middle of it. Yes, okay. Either do- doing it or in the middle of it. If you are having financial questions, not even necessarily problems, just questions, uh, Gra- Brad Graber is having tons of gossip going around at church because everybody is just talking about how awesome it is. It's, it's good gossip. Um, <laughs> Is that such a thing? (laughs) I just made it up. Good gossip. So anyways, uh, super, super helpful, and a lot of people are being encouraged by that. But I, again, want to give you four just quick points to think about, file them away. Um, The first one under finances is examine your motives and desires. I love this quote from Carolyn Mahaney in Feminine Appeal, which I have up here. The world doesn't judge us by our theology. The world judges us by our behavior. People don't necessarily want to know what we believe about the Bible. They want to see if what we believe makes a difference in our lives. It's a really good, it's a really good quote to think about. What are, what are we saying? So examine your motives and desires when it comes to finances. Secondly, be easy to lead. Has your husband given up leading you in your finances because you've made it difficult for him? I don't know of specifically anybody in this room, but I do know of couples where the husbands have just given up because it's just a big headache. They don't want to try because they've tried and it didn't work. Or they got so much grief about it, they're just going to back off. Um, Do you argue so much about it that it becomes just easier to ignore for him? It's just, it's not worth it. It's not worth the argument. We all know that ignoring just makes the snowball bigger until it crashes into something at the end. Um, Then you've also got the flip side of this, which maybe you do want your husband to lead, and he's not. That's a reality as well in a room this size. Do not get discouraged, um, because that brings us to the next point. 
The third thing I want you to think about under finances is being content. Now this is easier to say than it is to do, but I want you to think about this statement. Contentment is not based on a situation, but on a commitment, okay? If you have a husband that won't lead, pray for contentment and posture yourself, because who can you only be in charge of? You. Posture yourself to set him up for success as much as you can. So again, you're trying, and maybe he doesn't take it, and, and then you go to plan B or C. Um, but posture yourself to set him up for success as much as you can. Um, pray that God will put a godly man in his life to help him along. Um, never underestimate the power of obedience to Scripture and to the Lord. I had a friend that was in a marriage. She was a strong Christian, married this guy from church that said he was a Christian, and then it ended up that he wasn't a Christian. Um, and they were in gobs of debt, and he really wanted a motorcycle, like you know, a fifty thousand dollar motorcycle, something on top of their already bad debt. And she was just freaking out because she's thinking, oh my gosh, there's nothing I can do. And the Lord is not going to protect me from this. He's going to run us into the ground. And you know how fear there. Oh, there it goes. Fear. Oh, and then we can run down that road in about 3.9 seconds of having the end of the world coming. Um, and I'm sorry, is that just me? <laughs> um, and so anyways, long story short, she prayed about it. She did what she could do on her own. She set him up for success as much as she could. And the Lord protected her personally in the details. So it, it happens. Um, but here's a thing I want to encourage you ladies that are more in this area, though the ladies that are in this area can also be um, challenged by this. This is called... The 30 Days of Encouraging Your Husband Journal. Now, it's for the guys that are easy to write about. I love this. I love this. He does this. It's so wonderful. It's for those. But it also has a little paragraph, and it's set up in such a way where it's just that small bit of reading for the day, and then you journal your thoughts on this side. It gives you ideas if you are married to someone that you're not really happy to be married to right now. And you literally have to stop and think, whew, I don't really have to think about what in the world I am going to write on this piece of paper because I am not feeling like I'm in love with this guy right now. Um, I'm not feeling like honoring him right now. I'm not feeling like respecting him right now. This, super helpful. For all stages. I did it. It's full. I would highly recommend you take a picture of the front. If you open it up, that's, that's your fault. <laughs> I, didn't, I don't think I wrote my name in it, so I'm not going to... Um, we know you're right. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I didn't want to be filmed, because now I have to be held accountable for what I say. Okay, now, last but not least, number four, work with your husband on a budget and stick with it. Here's the hard part. Even if he doesn't. Yeah. Try, right? Ooh, just try. You know, if this is a contention in your marriage and we know that communication, finances, and intimacy are the three biggest argument makers in marriage, just try to set him up as much as you can. And there, again, are so many resources. The Graver class, uh, Dave Ramsey's got material out. YNAB, that's what we use. Eric loves it. He loves anything technology. It's you need a budget, YNAB, and you've got it both on both your phones. It syncs. It's, it's just great. Um, if you love technology, you'll love it even more. Um, communication, this is where communication comes in, right? You're setting your marriages up for success when you communicate about Communication, revisiting an argument, uh, finances, I'm getting this, we have this much to spend, I'm not going to go over that, you know, all of this boils down to communication. That's why in premarital, we usually tell people it's really just communication, communication, con communication are the top three things because that's, that's how they break down. Now, if we could please turn the video off.
we're going to talk about intimacy. Are you ready? Are you ready to buckle your seats? <laughs> I've discovered a clever way to blame what I'm about to say on someone else. <laughs> so I'm just going to quote what somebody else said. And this is Carolyn Mahaney again. So the first point, write it down under intimacy, is encourage your husband. And I'm going to read what she says. Several years ago at a church leadership conference, I hosted a panel of pastor's wives at a women's session. The women posed the question, what's one thing you've learned that encourages your husband? Um, as the other women on the panel answered, I pondered my response. I know what CJ's answer would be, but dare I say that? And then it was my turn. Make love to him, I blurted out. <laughs> That's what my husband would say if he were here. The room interrupted into a wave of nervous, snowing laughter. It's true. Engaging in this physical expression of marital intimacy and union is one of the most meaningful ways I can encourage my husband. And then she goes on to talk. How many of you have read this book just by a raise of hands? Okay. I need more hands by next year. This is a really good book. Come take a picture of it. I love her because she's practical and she's godly. And she's not, uh, not scared to talk about things. In fact, on page 84 is the C word. And I'm just going to leave it at that. And you guys can look it up and look at that page yourselves when you read that book. So encourage your husband. See, I would have said it if I wasn't on video. Um, have you studied your husband? Do you know what he likes? Do you know what he would say? Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I'm not talking specifically, like sometimes Eric just wants cookie dough. That is, he loves cookie dough and he wants a lot of it. And so I have to make it and he eats it and then he's happy. No. Um, you know, but maybe it's something else. Now, after you think you've studied your husband, how would your husband answer that same question? Would his answers match your answers? Because maybe, again, that communication breakdown, maybe he, you would think this is really encouraging, but he would say, actually, this is really encouraging. So find that out. Study your husbands. Not all husbands are the same. And it's going to require communication, right? Okay, number two, be involved. Just write in your notes, page 83. Read it. And I have to ask this question. Why? And this is rhetorical. Why should Christians have great sex? Because God made it. Mm, the world has taken it away and made it nasty. God created it. We need to take it back from the world. It's not a taboo subject. Um, and it is how we participate in a reciprocal act of thoughtfulness, humility, and service. Oh, that's all good stuff. Apply that to your intimacy. Um, our marriages, I think Eric even said this, our marriages prior to the marriage bed lead to enjoyable acts of intimacy. So yeah, if you're distant outside of the room, you're not going to be all of a sudden madly in love when you get in the room. That switch doesn't turn that quick. Um, so great marriages will probably end up having great intimacy. Um, but again, because we have different differing marriages in this room, you might be thinking, eh, but my husband's not romantic, so I just can't get into it, quite honestly. It's just not something I enjoy. Well, um, that's when he needs to read the Sex, Romance, and the Glory of God book. What husband's not going to pick that up if you put it on the coffee table? <laughs> well, you know, and then they're going to look at the table of contents and flip to the, you know, yeah. <laughs> Your husband's going to read that, okay? So buy it. Isn't Father's Day coming up soon? Yeah. <laughs> buy it and, you know, it's from the kids. Um, <laughs> what we tell people to do in premarital counseling after they're married, none of you girls can read this yet if you're not married. Um, and don't give it to your husbands yet. That won't be helpful. But after you're married, have the wife read it first. Mark all her specific things that she likes in the book, in the margins. Then you give it to the husband. Instant personal resource for your wife. 
because I like flowers, but if Eric brings me to um, Speedway to get a Coca-Cola Slurpee, mm, <laughs> I love him a lot. <laughs> I like flowers, but I like Coca-Cola Slurpees more than flowers. And don't give me a diamond tennis bracelet. Take me to Charlotte Russe on their sale days and let me get something for $5 because spending a lot of money on jewelry would be ridiculous for me. So know yourself and then let your husband get to know you, right? So that we're all on the same page doing the same thing. Okay. Um, third, and this is huge, be thoughtful. You might not put what I'm about to say in the thoughtful category, but thoughtfulness towards our husbands in the area of intimacy leads to creativity. If you have a boring job, do you love your boring job? No. If you have a boring friend, do you want to hang out with your boring friend? Probably not. You don't want to have a boring life of intimacy or you don't want to do it that often. So you want to try new things. You want to ask questions. You probably saw some of those on the cards. Those are on purpose. Singles, put those at the bottom of the deck. Then put the jokers, then put the ones on top so that you don't go past the jokers yet. This book I bought at the half price bookstore for a dollar as a joke. I was going to give it to somebody we were doing premarital with and I started reading it and I couldn't put it down. It is, uh, it is called, what did you say? You got it? Oh, you wrote it! Deborah! <laughs> You have done a tremendous work for us this one. Thank you so much. All of your writing. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even connect that. So this is called The Christian Woman's Guide to Sexuality. Okay, by Deborah Evans. Amazing. Um, super comprehensive book. It's a little bit of a thicker one, so it's a read, but it helps you be creative. I think there are some marriage books that are helpful, but you're still left asking questions. I cannot tell you how many women I've met with whose mothers do not talk to them about anything. And I'm there hopefully to pick up some slack and say, okay, yeah, you're not gonna lock yourself in the bedroom on the, on the wedding night. Some have, not, not on my watch. Um, <laughs> but you and think about growing up in a christian environment you tell your kids no 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 bad 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 don't 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 boom one walk down the aisle opens the doors you're scared to death because this is it's been bad and horrible ever since you've been born and now all of a sudden you're allowed to do whatever you want yeah it's too much freedom <laughs> it's scary so this talks about anything from the design of your body to um What's another helpful thing? I mean, there's a, there's a whole chapter on how to give a good massage. Fantastic. I tried it out on Eric, a facial. He fell asleep. It was so good. No kidding. It was my first time. Read the book, okay? <laughs> Super duper helpful. And it also, on a serious note, it does have an excellent chapter on uh, past abuse. If there's anybody in this room that has had past abuse, excellent chapter to help you navigate those thoughts and some of those lies in your mind and how they leak into your marriage. Super, super good. And again, if you do not have somebody to talk to you about this, seriously, come talk to me. I like coffee. I like Slurpees. <laughs> I like lunch. We can go do this and talk at the same time. Okay. All right. Last but not least, and I am reminded when I talk to some women about this, uh, how many people don't either know this passage or don't connect the dots? Close the door for Satan, number four, under intimacy. Close the door for Satan. In other words, be active, okay? 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, don't deprive one another so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I can't tell you how many people have kinks in their intimacy lives that have never heard that verse. And, and then when I tell them, they're like, what? 
and it just opens up a whole new door uh, for things. Your husband's temptation will be lessened. Now, we live in a sinful world, so none of our husbands are perfect, but we can lessen it if they're, in the words of Proverbs, drinking much from their own cisterns. They will not be thirsty to go somewhere else if they're satisfied. Does that make sense? Um, so you have a privilege. I think some of them, some of us sometimes look at it as a duty, which if we're all honest, sometimes it is. But if we're thinking biblically about it, it is a privilege because we are working with the Lord to lessen their temptation. And again, it promotes intimacy in the, the fullest expression of the term, closeness. So close the door for Satan. Um, we even tell couples in premarital when, when intimacy is new and you know, you're, you're just navigating it for the first time, talk about frequency. If your husband thinks seven days a week is great and you think one day a week is great, you're constantly going to be <laughs> not meeting up on the same page. You what? Again, we just, you know, and he's like, yeah, because you're not communicating about it. You're both functioning off of two different numbers. If you talk about it, oh, well, then now we can sort of, you know, not that the number is godly, but at least get on the same page as far as communication. So think of intimacy as a privilege, not a duty. And again, looking at the board, communicate, communicate, communicate. The best marriages with the best intimacy are the people that are communicating about the intimacy. Cool? Okay. Last but not least, and this is going to be quick, I like to feed my children healthy food, but every once in a while, I don't know what it is about mac and cheese, but it's just a nice, yummy, gooey food to eat. So I thought, well, at least we could put some broccoli in there. That's great news because it makes it a little bit healthier. Then I realized over here, real cheese and milk is in here. Excellent. So I pull out the real cheese and milk. And I'm thinking that's probably not real cheese and milk, but it, it is oddly good sometimes. Um, but then my favorite is the broccoli. Can I hold it up to the light? Can you see it? Can you see the broccoli? Okay. I'm pretty sure that that is called false advertising. That is not broccoli. It would be a little more appropriate if it said broccoli flakes, maybe. Like four broccoli flakes. And don't tell me they're going to get bigger when you put them in the boiling water, because that's ridiculous. I want to ask you a couple of questions. They're rhetorical. Again, I'd rather you not write them down, think about them, take a picture of them if you want them to look at later. Just think about a couple of these for a second. Our children, young and old, so you older ladies in the room, don't think your kids aren't still watching you. What picture of the gospel mystery of marriage are we giving them? Are we giving them a false advertisement? Or are we giving them a true advertisement? Are we acting one way in public and another way at home? Are our husbands showing them how Christ loves the church? And are we showing them how to submit and respect our husbands? Your kids know that. My kids know when Eric and I have had an argument. Not because we're loud, but because we're not as lovey as we were 20 minutes before. Our kids know. They watch. Um, are you reading helpful parenting books that teach you biblical principles? Whenever anybody gets pregnant, the first book they run out and buy is what to expect when you're expecting. Why would you not buy more parenting books as you get to those different stages where you don't know what you're doing? It's okay to not know. <laughs> you, need, you need books, though, or somebody, you know, somebody to disciple you. Okay, this is a really bad one. Have you asked your child's forgiveness when you have sinned against them? It's really awful to do that. I just had to do that recently, and I was in tears. It was terrible. 
It was probably really awkward for them. Um, <laughs> and I did apologize. I'm sorry for crying and making this weird. Um, but it is, uh, it, you're really saying so much more than just asking for forgiveness. You're teaching in that moment. Are you talking to your children about age-appropriate sex? I have a book. You can take a picture of it. There's a series of like three or four of these. Can I beg you to please have conversations with your kids? Oh, it, this world is so crazy. And it's not that the conversation is going to save your kid from their sinful hearts and desires, but it's going to set them up to think right or wrong about certain things. And you don't want to leave it to the school bus. Really, you don't leave, want to leave it to the school bus. And you don't want them to Google the question. Yeah, like you can't get pregnant on the first time. Mm, yeah. So there are really helpful resources. If you're scared to death to have a conversation, come talk to me. We've done these books with our boys. They're so good, and they give just enough information at just the right time. Okay, next question. Um, how many nights a week do you sit down to a meal together? and have good conversations. Um, you have so much um, influence in your homes. If we take knowing God, knowing ourselves and our sin and our idols and our desires, knowing our husbands and how we can help them in specific ways, and knowing that our kids are watching, our ultimate motivating factor is God's glory, obviously, as Christians. And if you're not, please talk to me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, why is our ultimate motivating factor God's glory? Because we believe these things, right? We, if we didn't believe these things, it's way too much work to do this. Way too much work and sacrifice. Ugh. And telling people that you're a sinner? Mm, no, no thanks. But if, if this is real, and we know this is real, and this is real, then we're going to do it because we want to bring glory to our God. So here's my question, last question, and then you can go. Ladies, uh, especially some of you older ladies, if you have not heard anything new that I have taught today, which is quite possible for some of you older ladies. What question do you think I'm going to ask next? Are you sharing that with someone younger than you? We need it, ladies. Look around this room, for those of you that go to Castleview, and think about how many women in the church are not here. They're not here for several different reasons. Some are out of town, some have legit things, some can, you know, whatever, child care, whatever. But some of them are not here because they don't want to hear this. Some of them are not here because they don't have husbands who will come with them, and so they want to give up. But when we are standing before the Lord, we are only in charge of ourselves. So don't let your husbands stunt your spiritual growth, okay? That's crucial because it's hard. And I, and I don't know how you would do life as a Christian married to either a non-Christian or um, someone that is just not abiding in Christ uh, and doing it on your own. That's got to be miserable. Don't let it be miserable. People are here for you and want to be your friends and help. So um, tons of resources, tons of information. You've got your papers. I'm going to let you go to lunch. I will leave this out. I will leave my notes here. So go to lunch. I'm going to pray for you. Go to lunch. And then if you want to take pictures and stuff, I'll leave this here. I'll leave this here. And you can do this after lunch. Um, and then right when we get back, it's Q&A, right? With the, I don't have my name tag on. I was going to look at it. Yeah, it's back in the main session. So let me pray for us super quick. God, we thank you for today. We thank you that we're here. We thank you that there is always something to learn. Uh, even as Eric and I teach at these things, our conversations are enriched by how we can learn and grow more and apply things. I pray for each of these ladies at whatever stage they're in in their marriages, 
um, and the single ones that are watching and waiting, I pray that you just give us all grace and patience and endurance and help us to be the women that you've called us to be. In your son's name, amen. This has been a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church or our senior pastor, Eric Bancroft, please click on the link below or visit castleview.org.